Uh, now I have to say I followed a similar career to the one of Elena. And actually we worked together at JET. I also did theoretical physics in, at the University of Madrid. And then I did my PhD on experimental research at JET and modeling following another internships. And actually then uh, um, I also work at JET. I was a SEO leader and uh, was on plasma world interaction and modeling. And then I moved to Garhin, where Elena came for shortly afterwards, and I was responsible for the for the European program on plasma world interaction. So I've been most of my career interested in, in issues of uh, core edge plasma integration in terms of integrating the fusion performance with uh, power loads on the world, which can be handled. So I, I'm going to, um, and then I, I moved to ITER and and this is what you explained. And we, I, I am now the head of the of the science division, where we are responsible for the for the scientific exploitation on ITER and also the design of the plasma control system, the design of the data analysis, not the individual diagnostic, but the data consistency analysis and, and integrated modeling. Apart from supporting with physics input, the design and manufacturing of ITER components, because you know, when you manufacture components, things don't go exactly according to plan, and then you have to evaluate what are the consequences. So I will just give us a, a, a talk on the objective of ITER, what is the status. This is a photo of the ITER site. Uh, I will describe more detail what you can see there. So the, the first I will give, and since you are, I understand many of you are starting in, in fusion this year, so I will give a short, uh, overview of what is the basic uh, physics base of ITER and the goals and what is the overall design. And then I, I will go more into the where we are regarding construction and then uh, how what we plan to do to do in ITER experimentally to achieve the fusion goals. So, so the first, of course, ITER wants to demonstrate the tech, scientific and technological feasibility of fusion power. So this, of course, is based on the DT fusion reaction where we produce uh, helium and, and neutron. The helium has to be contained in the plasma to heat the plasma and in this way provide the net energy gain, as, as Elena said, of a factor of 10. Um, it is an experiment and this is quite clear. Uh, we are not going to produce electricity. If, if we were to produce electricity, the amount of electricity that we would consume would be probably very similar to the one we use. But what we have to demonstrate is that this is technically and, and technologically feasible. So there are two objectives to the project. It's not a pure scientific experiment. It's, it's also a, a technology experiment at, at the same time. Um, so for this, of course, we have to achieve temperatures uh, typically of the order of, of 10 kV, 10 to, to 50 kV, which is 10 to, to, uh, to uh, 100, uh, 100 to, to 500 uh, uh, Kelvin million Kelvin. Uh, so the basis of, of, of fusion energy, as I said, is you produce a high energy, a high energy uh, helium and neutrons. The neutrons are used to, to basically will be used in a reactor to heat up the, the coolant and produce, uh, produce uh, electricity from it. And the helium uh, uh, has to stay in the plasma, gives its energy to the plasma and heat it up. And in that way, you can get the plasma to sell heat. And this is what we call a burning plasma. Now, uh, quantitatively, we define the production of energy by the plasma, and this is not the total energy balance, it's the production of how much energy the plasma produces with respect to the external heat uh, with the Q, which is the fusion gain. And from this uh, Q, um, the total amount of heat that gets into the plasma is, at, is only the alpha heating and the external heat, and this gives a ratio and which says that the Basically, the self-produced power that hits the plasma divided by the stagnal heat is this fusion gain divided by five. And this is a very important number uh, because this determines when a plasma is dominated in terms of heating physics and plasma physics by the alpha particles compared when it is not dominated. And that is what set actually the Q of ITER to be a factor of 10. This means that the, the heat that the ITER plasma produces is twice the, the standard heat, and therefore the plasma is dominated by, by fusion production. To achieve uh, uh, that the plasma heats more by alpha particles by external heat, we need to get, as I said, a plasma which has a temperature of 100 million degrees or 10 Kelvin, and so that is sufficiently dense and, and has a high enough temperature. And this, as you have seen, probably this is the progress towards the ITER domain. 
uh, where we have shown that we can actually achieve these plasmas. You can see that typical experiments nowadays tends to be in a range of temperatures where the electron temperature is lower than the ion temperature, where it is in range where the electrons and the ions will be the same. And this point here is the recent uh, result from JET that was announced earlier this year uh, with the production of a 59 megawatt or megajoules of, of fusion energy. So this is what it sits. So we are now in a range of heater parameters in terms of temperature densities, which are actually not so far from the ones we expect in heater. What we are missing of this of this sorry of this um, product is the energy confinement time, which is the time the plasma keeps the energy inside, and this cannot be achieved in the present generation of fusion devices simply because they are not large enough or they have had enough current and, and field, basically. Now, um, so what do we do? How do we achieve these hot uh, and, and dense plasmas? So for this, we use uh, magnetic fields. The magnetic fields are produced by coils, and ITER is based on a tokamak design. So what you do is you have a set of toroidal coils that create a toroidal field in the toroidal direction. So here, this is a Eurofusion plot. Um, uh, and then you have a, a solenoid in the central of this coil that produces a current in the plasma. And the combination of these two plus some uh, shaping, which is done with this uh, poloidal coil in gray, allows you to keep the plasma stable, controlling position. And this, this, this magnetic field provides two things. One is decreases the, the heat losses of the gas across the field, because of course hot gases, like any hot gases, lose energy, but also provides the compression force, because if not, of course, the plasma would could uh, expand and cool down. And from a stability point of view, there is a stability criteria in Tokamaks that says that if you want to have a plasma which is stable um, and keep the, the plasma itself, you have to do total transfer toroidal, uh, poloidal trans, and this is what we call Q. And this is a quite important design parameter for, for ITER and all Tokamaks. The main uh, problem we have and is that when you heat up the plasma, you can circulate the current through it. But plasma has this specific feature that the hotter they are, the less resistive they are. This is unlike all other materials. When you heat up a material, it typically gets more resistive. And this is a consequence of the, of the plasmas being dominated by Coulomb collision. So this means that just by circulating larger and larger currents into the plasma, you cannot heat it up. And this is a plot, if you use uh, confinement time, we expect to have an heater in low confinement regimes that show that it is impossible to go to a temperature which is basically beyond of the order of, of, um, of uh, one few kV on average in heater, simply because you don't heat enough. So to heat the plasma, we use electromagnetic waves. So these are similar to, to a microwave oven, of course, or very large dimensions, where we t t choose re um, characteristic frequencies of the electrons and the ions in the magnetic field to deposit this wave. Or we can actually also inject uh, with a, a particle accelerator what we call neutral beams. And this is like putting a small amount of hot water, very hot water into a, a cold bath. Then, of course, it, it increases the, the temperature. And these are the two types of heating system which are used in ITER and all fusion devices. Now, as I said, the main challenge of the of the plasma achieving fusion is that you have to keep the plasma dense, hot, and that the energy has to stay there for a long time. Because if not, you basically have to heat so much that it's impossible to get a positive balance in the sense that the plasma produces fusion power and self heats. And to determine, this is determined by by anomalous transport processes. Uh, now we are starting to understand them better. At the time where ITER was designed, these were not understood. And this is why in, in sufficient detail, and this is why ITER is basing what we call a scaling loss, which is basically you do like a wind tunnel experiment in several devices which are similar, and you extrapolate what is the, the size that the plasma should have in ITER. And this scaling law is what determines the plasma size in ITER. To be completely uh, Fair, what we have found, and this is a progress of, of uh, this scaling law was uh, derived in, in 1998. And uh, if you look at the papers from the EPS conference of 2019, you will see there is a, an invited talk and a paper from um, Paola Mantica, where basically she shows that on the basis of the advanced knowledge that we have today, we can say that this was a good scaling law to use to design it there. So the main thing is that you have to keep the plasma hot enough, and it has to lose the energy slow enough, and it is designed to lose the energy in three and a half seconds, more or less. 
and this allows you to achieve a, a high alpha particle production. And then because of the stability limits, they, as I said, you have to keep this, this number of toroidal turns to greater than two. In iter, we are designed to, to three, and this gives you not to be at the limit. And this gives you a relation between the minor radius, the major radius, the toroidal field, and the plasma current. That depends on the plasma shape, etc. And this is the basic principle of the of the design of it. So to get a, a, a fusion gain of 10, which is the same to get twice the alpha heating compared to the external heat, ITER has to have these dimensions because of these uh, dependencies of the of the scaling law. Now, ITER itself, as I said, is a, is a very large tokamak. And these are the, as I said, it has the objectives of demonstrating the scientific and technical um, feasibility of fusion energy. So this has a, a set of technological choices, like I will discuss later, but it also has a, a fusion goal. So we transform this very high level objective onto precise goals. So what we want to achieve is a fusion gain of more than 10, which means that the alpha heating is twice the standard heat for lengths of the order of uh, five to, to 10 minutes. For this, the machine is designed to be able to sustain plasmas up to 15 megaamps with a toroidal field of 5.3 Tesla. As I said, in this case, the alpha the particle um, uh, dominates. Uh, in these conditions, we cannot keep the, the, the plasma going on for longer simply because we cannot induce the plasma current for longer times because the, you have a lot of, of inductive energy into the plasma. So a large part of the energy of the solenoid goes into the plasma. So if we want to go to longer pulses, then we have to do it at reduced currents. And in this case, we get uh, Q equal five, which means that the alpha heating is equal to the external heat. And the, the, there we have two objectives. One is to maintain a, a, uh, up to a thousand seconds, a hybrid scenario. And then uh, the final goal is to have a steady state operation. This is in either 3000 seconds. So this is about one hour pulse. And the, in principle, it can be sustained indefinitely. This 3000 seconds is just limited by the cooling, the total energy that we can actually cool the machine every hour. So we cannot produce more, not because the, the, the we cannot control the plasma, we cannot create the plasma for longer. It's simply that we cannot actually cool the machines uh, sufficient because, as I said, it is an experiment. But the sustaining a um, few hundred megawatt fusion production for an hour is already quite close to what you want in a reactor. Now, the scenarios that we have, I saw the two streams. So this is the 15 mega amp scenario. So this is a plasma in which you create a current. This is in red. On the right side, you see, uh, you see uh, how the plasma is created, uh, what the plasma shape, and the currents in the coils. As they get uh, to green, yellow, or red, they approach the limit. So you basically create a plasma. Uh, you drive the current up to 50 mega amp, then you heat it up. And when the temperature uh, is large enough, the alpha heating, which is the red trace at the bottom, shoots up. And then you sustain this plasma for a given amount of time until you can see that your solenoid starts to get very red. And when your solenoid starts to get very red, at some point, you, you basically exceed how much induced current you can create in the plasma, and you ram the plasma current down. So in this scenario, the tricky part is not to sustain the inductive, the the, flat, the, the stationary part, because that's driven by the, the central solenoid. The tricky part are the access and exit part, because you have, this is like um, when you fly with the plane, the tricky parts are the takeoff and the landing. Then we have, as I said, in this case, most of the current is just driven by the by the central solenoid, the plasma has processes by which, because of the heating systems you use and the, and the physics of the plasma itself, can drive plasma itself without the central solenoid. Uh, but in this case, this is very moderate. It's only about 30% of the total. On the other stream, we have the steady state scenario. In this case, uh, the, the complete plasma current is driven by external means. So actually the solenoid in this case has a very low current and stays constant through the 3000 seconds. Uh, so you drive the current by the radio frequency waves and the hot neutrals that you inject. And also because of the gradients of the pressure and the density of the plasma, this is what is called the bootstrap current. And when we do that, we can actually set, as I said, take, keep the plasma indefinitely in this case, what is tricky is actually to control the plasma for two reasons. One is because uh, you need the, 
that the energy confinement compared to the to the scaling law is is very good. It is 50% above what you would expect in normal conditions, and this means that you have to have a very tight control of the of the way the current circulates, the current profile, to achieve this this very high uh, energy confinement in the plasma. And the second thing is that you are operating very close to stability limits. So there are, as I said, there are these twist limits, which I mentioned, there are also pressure limits, and you have the possibility that the plasma goes uh, uh, unstable. And when the plasma goes unstable, the magnetic fields are broken, the field lines are broken, and you lose all the plasma because the plasma is not confined more by the magnetic field. So here, this is a question, it is a very challenging uh, scenario from the point of view of maintaining the confinement in the plasma, but also control, and this is why it is let's say in the ether uh, exploitation it comes uh, after the the what we call inductive q equal 10 scenario now there are a few ingredients how we plan to achieve this high fusion performance in ether one is the achievement of a high energy confinement this course is called the h mod this is a mode of operation that was discovered uh, 40 years ago now in in Astes at, at ipp garhin and basically is the is, is a case the the low confinement is just the typical energy the typical pressure you get into a plasma the more pressure the more fusion power by the way so the fusion power goes with the pressure square so you, the, the, when you gain you know 50% in, in to a factor of two in pressure, you actually get a factor of four infusion power. That is why we want to get the highest confinement to the plasma. And this is due to the formation of a region at the edge of the plasma where the plasma turbulence that drives the losses of the plasma reduce. And this is what we use to design it. This H equal one means that the confinement of the plasma is equal to our scaling law. This poses some problems here because you get very, very steep. Uh, uh, temperature gradients and, and density gradients. This is what we call the pedestal to give you an idea in ether uh, in about six centimeters you you multiply your your temperature by by a factor of, of 500 typically of the order of 550 to, to 100. So this is actually quite large. You get temperatures at the within you know within six centimeters you get temperatures which are ten times or five times hotter than the than the center of the sun and uh, and this creates some very um, that can create instabilities because the magnetic field cannot sustain this this pressure gradient the force of the magnetic field cannot contain the 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 pressure of the plasma and then as I said to get beyond uh, this uh, 500 megawatt, uh, 300 seconds, we need to get uh, improved confinement, which which comes because we not only have a higher pressure at the edge, but also higher pressure at the core. This requires shaping the current profile in a specific way. And when we get there, then we can actually make the plasma to 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 last for longer and produce, uh, although it produces less power than the 500 megawatts, we typically expect to produce 400, 350. The access to this confinement depends on heating up the plasma up to a given level and then the plasma self-transition. And as I said, since discovery of the HMOD 40 years ago, people are working on this. And now there is some, I think, good idea what are the physics uh, process that lead to this. But in terms of quantitatively predicting what would be the power that we need to achieve in ITER, uh, we still base on, on empirical scaling. And OK. Then this is important for the ITER exploitation because this uh, power depends on the impurities, on the gas species. And in ITER, as I will explain later, we are not going to start with ET operation. We are going to start with hydrogen, helium, and then we will progress towards ethereum. So it is important to understand how this power that you need depends on the on the gas species because at the beginning of ITER actually is quite challenging to operate in this regime. But it's very important we demonstrate before we go to fusion power production. Now, as I said, there are a few things that we have to integrate in ITER. We have very large uh, fluxes on the components that I will show later surround the ITER plasma. You, that you can typically get in the area where it receives the highest flux, which is this, uh, this uh, blue um, area on the, on the left figure. The typical fluxes you can get in ITER are of the order of the surface of the sun or a factor of two higher. So we are typically talking of fluxes that can arrive to these components, which are of the order of 50 to 100 megawatts per square meter. As I said, this is typically comparable of twice the, the surface of the sun. To do to handle these fluxes, of course, is impossible. So we, we have designed what we call plasma facing components that I will show later. 
they are made of tungsten. They can handle very high fluxes, but not so high. So what we have to, not high enough, let's say, you cannot handle 50 to 100 megawatts per square meter. So what we do is we create at the edge of the plasma, we have a very hot plasma in the center. And at the edge of the plasma, actually, we are able to create a very cold plasma where we, we inject impurities and they radiate uh, the energy away. So we basically create an enormous uh, fluorescent bulb with neon, like a neon tube. The only thing is that it radiates 60 megawatts of, of power. And because of this, this is light, it's emitted uh, every, it's basically deposited everywhere, and we are able to, to lower the heat fluxes to the, the engineering limit, which is 10 megawatts per square meter. Another issue, which is the, the one that is shown on the on the right side, which has stopped for some reason. Uh, these are perturbations which are created at the plasma edge because of these gradients that um, that I mentioned before when you achieve high confinement plasmas and they lead to small releases of the plasma energy. Typically, a uh, few percent of the iter plasma energy is lost in these events, but because the iter plasma energy is so large, um, this actually causes significant problems to the to the materials which are in contact with the plasma and you can get them severely melted and, and therefore this would lead to, to uh, this could basically need to to a frequent replacement which of course is very time consuming so we have to control these heat fluxes on the on the components the stationary ones and the transient one to be sure that that we don't damage the first wall because we don't on the diverter where the energy of the plasma is deposited because we have to replace it and the replacement of these components is of the order of at least six months so it's basically if you damage one you you know you have to stop operation for six months and this is not a very efficient way of, of running an experimental facility and most important in terms of of uh, global instability and power flashes is what we call disruptions when you have disruption this is this is because you approach these instability limits, which are mentioned. I mentioned before your pressure profile, the pressure is too high, your pressure profile is too peak, or your current profile is too peak, and then you lose completely the plasma. So the plasma cools down. So you go from temperatures of many hundreds of, of, uh, of millions of degrees to, to few or less. And then in that case, or hundreds of thousands, and then in that case, the plasma current decays, the plasma becomes very resistive, and the plasma current decays. And this leads to very large uh, forces because the plasma current suddenly disappears, interacts with the magnetic field. The plasma moves vertically. This is what is shown here. And you create very large loads on the areas of contact between the plasma and the and the wall of the, of the reactor and, and very large currents. And to show this, I can show here the typical the, if you if you take the case of of ITER, which has a beryllium wall like jet, uh, in the case of of uh, of a jet, actually, in order to avoid melting of the wall, you have to actually see ways, and I will discuss later what you do to avoid that the energy of the plasma ends up on the wall already for for currents of the order of two megams. In the case in ITER, we think that is more of the order of, of five megams, actually more than four. We have refined the operation, but since we have to operate at 50 megam to get high fusion power production, it means that for a significant range of of, uh, of ITER operation, we have to we have to actually be able to avoid these these fluxes going onto the wall of, of the machine. Now, ITER as such, as I said, is a large tokamak. So it is a superconducting tokamak. So all the coils are superconducting. They are made of different materials for the highest field one, which is the central solenoid and the toroidal field coils, which are here in gray, and the central solenoid, which is in the center. We use niobium tin. This can go to 13 Tesla at, at 4.5K. And for the, for the lower fields, which are the pink coils, which are the the poloidal field coils, we use an iobium tin. This is the typical superconducting material which is used in accelerators, and this can get you to about uh, six Tesla. We also have another set of coils that we'll discuss later, which are which are also superconducting but have lower currents. Uh, because the machine is superconducting, you have to keep the complete machine at very low temperatures, all the coils. So this is in, in uh, enclosed in a, in a cryostat. To where you keep vacuum to reduce the the heat losses this cryostat and the machine is shielded as i will show by what we call thermal shields to prevent heat losses and heat fluxes on the on the coils and then internally we have a vacuum vessel where we basically create the vacuum that we require to 
to, to create the plasma, this is made of steel, and the vacuum vessel is covered by by set of uh, what we call blanket modules. These are the, the modules where the neutron energy is absorbed. They are steel and water cool, and they are cladded by beryllium. Beryllium uh, is the, the, the one of the materials which is in contact with the plasma, and it's chosen because it has a very a very low atomic set. So when the beryllium atoms enter in the plasma, they, they don't contaminate a lot and they don't radiate a lot of the plasma energy away. And for the area, where we get the larger fluxes at the bottom of the machine. We have what we call a diverter, and this is what I mentioned is done of tungsten. Sorry, there is a mistake. It's not CFC, it's tungsten. I will correct it. And this is, can handle heat fluxes up to 10 megawatt per square meter continuously and 20 megawatt per square meter for periods of 10 seconds. And then we have a set of coils to control the plasma that we'll discuss later. Cryo pumps to pump the helium that we produce in the plasma, because if not, the fusion reaction stops because you have no more fuel. And of course, we have all these ports where we have a heating systems, diagnostics, and fueling systems, etc. Now, from the heating system point of view, we have, as I said, accelerators with what we call neutron beam injector, where we accelerate uh, ions to one mega electron volts, then we neutralize them to inject them in the plasma, because if not, of course, they follow the magnetic fields and they are deposited on the wall. And we have radio frequency systems that resonate at the electron cyclotron uh, frequency and at the ion cyclotron frequency. And these all basically integrated into a very large building that I will, I will show later. We have a, a very extensive set of diagnostics. We have 60 diagnostics. They are located inside the vessel, in the ports of the machine. There are 18 ports at two levels and between the toroidal field coils. And then we have a set of three-dimensional coils, uh, which are um, there to correct the asymmetries of the magnetic field due to construction inaccuracies and position inaccuracies. These are in green. Which are, which are superconducting coils, they are outside the vessel. And then in blue, we have a set of copper coils which are internal in the machine and they are to control these in edge instabilities, which I, mentioned, which I mentioned earlier. There are 27 coils in three rows of, of nine. And they basically perturb the 2D structure of the magnetic field to avoid these instabilities. Uh, as I said, to dissipate the plasma energy, when the plasma becomes totally unstable, we have the disruption mitigation system. This is like a series of uh, shotguns. Uh, we have 27 of them, and they inject a significant amount of material. You can see we can inject um, impurities. We can inject hydrogen to kind of cork size um, uh, pellets. These are made, they are basically at, at, at few Kilo, a few Kelvin, so that this is hydrogen or Argo or Neon, is a solid pellet, and we accelerate it to a few hundred kilometers per second, so it's like a bullet, more or less, and we can shoot up to 27 of these uh, per plasma uh, in order so that we actually don't damage the internal components, they, they go through a bend so that actually we don't shoot uh, a complete pellet. Into the plasma, we shoot, we shoot what we call a shard. So it's a bit like a shotgun. And in this way, we can actually inject a lot of material into the plasma before it becomes unstable and radiate the plasma energy and it doesn't go into the, into the world. This is a complex system which we are now finishing the, the design. Now, I go to it as a project and an overview of the project status, so where we are, so what I explain is the physics and why the machine is as it is. So the first thing is that ITER, uh, the, the construction of ITER was decided, the, the design of ITER actually started in the early 90s, and the final design was completed in 2001. The decision was taken in 2006 to, to build the ITER in France. Uh, we the, the seven ITER members actually represent more than half of the world population, about 80% of the of the gross product. And they are China, the European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the and the USA. Uh, ITER is not only a very complex device, also an integration challenge and an international challenge, because you can see that every part of the machine is built by a different ITER member. So this is part of the essence of the ITER agreement, which is that the knowledge generated for ITER is shared by everybody. 
and this concerns not only the scientific knowledge but also the technological knowledge so everybody takes a part in the, a key part in the construction of the of the components in some cases you can see for the troida fichoids for instance six out of the seven iter members contribute to it in different parts of the of the coils in other places there are three etc but the 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 basic the basic uh, principle of it is that the knowledge is is shared which of course is very good uh, from the from the humankind point of view but make some challenge because you have different parts made in different places first the parts have to arrive to iter uh, which which is not simple because they are very large so here i just take some of the largest components as i said ether is uh, is all inside the thermoflux which we call the cryostat this is the the largest uh, stainless steel uh, pressure container ever built it it is like you know it's a, a 10 i mean if you take a, Typical uh, floor size is three meters, so it's about ten meters tall by ten, by ten ten floors tall by ten floors wide. It, pay, it weighs about uh, four thousand ton. This is made by India and welded because it cannot be transported um, complete. The the parts are made of India and they are welded uh, under Indian responsibility at the at the either side. The vacuum vessel. This is built by uh, Europe, Korea, and Russia. It's a double wall a vacuum vessel. This is a nuclear vessel, so this is our containment vessel. So it's the equivalent of a the fission reactor vessel. It's a high vacuum environment. It has a this is a, a volume of 1,400 uh, cubic meters. Of course, it goes inside the cryostat, and this is what basically uh, provides the plasma volume of iter, which is 840 when you put the in vessel components. The weight uh, eight and a half thousand ton, and it has of course um, nine sectors. Then there is the magnets, which are the toroidal field, the poloidal field magnets, and the central solenoid. And if you see here, the typical weight of an iter component is many hundred tons, and the typical dimensions is, uh, is several uh, tens of meters, uh, 10 to 20 meters, depends on the, on the component itself. The components themselves, as I said, are built in the iter members, then they are taken to the iter organization through a complicated path going through barge and then to roads. Uh, and they are very large, so this is the the roads have to be closed during the evening. And uh, since 2020, when we started the assembly of the machine, we got many of them. So we have uh, here examples of toroidal field coils from Europe and Japan arriving, toroidal field coils from China, vacuum vessel from Korea, the central solenoid from the US, and this is a recent one from the upper poloidal field coil of ITER leaving the harbor of St. Petersburg. Now, uh, from the point of view of the ITER side, so ITER is a tokamak, but of course it has many facilities. So this is the view of the ITER side. The tokamak is sited on the on the black building behind the first crane. Uh, on the left side, you can see cooling towers. On the right side, you can see long um, and kind of uh, long and, and not very tall buildings. There are three. The first two are the the rectifier, so we use alternate current from the electricity network that comes on the right, and we have to transform it into DC current. So we transform high voltage, low low intensity current into low voltage, high high density current. So because we need to power the coils to megaamps. And the third one at the back is the cryogenic plant with the tanks to keep the hydrogen and the helium and the the nitrogen, the, the nitrogen, the the helium and and compressor, etc. So this is the largest cryoplant single block in the in the world, and this is what we use to cool down the machine and all the components. And at the back, uh, at the very back, you see a long building which is with a red roof. This is where the poloidal field coils are made, because the some of them are the largest one cannot be transported. This is a European building where the the coils are made. And at the back, on the left side, you see a white building behind the the black building where the tokamak is, this is the cryostat building. This is where the cryostat is being welded. All of this takes is about 40, 40 uh, hectares. This from this side, so you can see here the cooling towers where we dissipate the plasma energy. On the left side of the of the black building, you see you see a, a building under construction with concrete. This is the tritium plant because ITER, of course, will use tritium. So this is the tritium plant, and and behind it there is a small building. Which, uh, with a low roof in in um, also in black, this is where the radio frequency systems are located. And the white building, as I said, is the the place where the cryostat is welded. 
this is a view from the top. So you see the, the all the infrastructure and the tokamak, as I said, the city here. So we assembly the tokamak just on top or on the north of the where you see the the on the upper part where you see the the tokamak. This is where it is assembled and then it's put together there. This is the control room. This is a recent photograph. Actually, it's now completely finished the building, and this is what it will look like uh, when it is finished, and this is what it will look like when you are inside. So. If you have been to a fusion experiment, this is not an unusual uh, control room. So you have a long display. On the right side, there are the machine parameters, engineering parameters. On the left side, there are in the, the engineering, the physics parameters. And the idea is that kind of the, the right side is dedicated to engineer, the left side is dedicated to physics, and the middle is dedicated to engineers and physics that are actually running the, the experiments. So this is more a view from the other side. So this is the physics side. The other side in the engineering side and in the middle is the, the people running the, the experiment, which are physicists and engineer. Now, regarding iter assembly, as I said, the tokamak itself is, is to embed it into a large building. This is what it will look like. On the left side of the tokamak, there is the tritium building. On the right side, there is the diagnostic building. Of course, when the tokamak is assembled, the top part of the of, of the of the top lid of the of the building is not built and the tokamak is assembled from the top so you can see on the right side you can see a photo of the assembly hall and you see a circular hole at the very end is actually where the tokamak goes so all the parts of the tokamak are taken from the assembly hall with these cranes and then they are lifted and inserted from the top so the machine is built bottom to top and in the assembly hall we have tools to to assemble the the components so the first uh, a crucial milestone for ITER was to put the base of the cryostat. This was done in May 2020, and is one of the heaviest parts of the machine. It was taken with these cranes and inserted into the tokamak building. So you can see here, this is like a circular building where the tokamak is a cylindrical building, and you can see this base which rest on this uh, on this kind of mushrooms that you see there. This is where the the cryostat uh, rest. So all the weight of the machine goes onto these mushrooms, and uh, when there are disruptions that move the machine around, then they take the the forces. The squares you see around are the connections to the ports. So you see here on the on the left the some oval holes. This is where the neutral beam injector goes and the other square ones are the ports where you connect the diagnostics, you connect the heating systems. The one at the bottom is where you connect the cryo pumps to pump the plasma. The machine itself, what is the tokamak itself, is assembled in some tools. So these are like triangular supports. I will show it. They are very large the structures where you put first one of the nine vacuum vessel sectors and then you assemble two coils from the the left and the right side. And this is what looks like in a CAD drawing. So you basically put the vacuum vessel sector, you assemble the coils, you align it to very high precision. And then when it is ready, you take it um, through this green part on the right with a hook, with a crane, and then you put it in the, in the final location. And this is a drawing, but I, actually last year we were able to complete the and this year we are able to complete the, the, the sequence. So I will just show it uh, now, but I think when you see the components, it's a bit more difficult to understand what you do. So this is a plot of the, as I said, this is a, this is a photo, a real photo of the vacuum vessel. So you see the vacuum vessel here. This, this orange structure is a structure which is put at the port of the vacuum vessel so that it doesn't deform under, under its weight because there they will be the port of the or one of the diagnostic system. The vacuum vessel will be heat up to 100 degrees during operation and to 200 degrees for outgassing. This is what we call baking. This is used in all the tokamaks to prepare the vacuum conditions. And in order that the heat of the vacuum vessel doesn't go into the coils, the vacuum vessel is shielded from the coils, which are the one on the right side. This is a toroidal field coil, but what we call a thermal seal. So this is a bit like a radiator. It's a plate which is cooled by gaseous helium at 80K that prevents the heat from the vacuum vessel at 100C to get to the toroidal field coils, which are at, at only 4, 4K. And as I said, they are assembled from the side, they are put together, and then they are lifted for assembly. This thing that I said, they are, they are, I'm actually, something is a process that takes more than a year. Eh? It's not a simple thing because I said the components, uh, each of these components measures uh, 15 to 
50 meters high and they weight a uh, few hundred tons. So this is uh, the, the example of the of the vacuum, the first vacuum vessel sector with two toroidal field coils. This weights more than a thousand ton and it was lifted for installation in May 2022. So you can see this crane that takes one and a half thousand tons taking this this component with the two toroidal field coils and one slide of the of the vacuum vessel and then move over to the tokamak piece. So you can see the, the vacuum vessel and the two toroidal field coils. These things which are there with holes on this, these two square pieces at the bottom of the coil where you can see many holes drilled. These are the things, the, the supports where you attach the coil to the to the cryostat. And these are very important because as I will show, we have to align the position of these coils, even if they are so large, et cetera, to sub millimeter pre precision. So this is the, the the vacuum vessel going over the wall to the tokamak fielding. You can see that the, the thing is tight. There are, even if this thing is very tall and weighs so long, there is only about 10 to 20 centimeters clear at the bottom to get there. And this is how you drop it into the tokamak uh, pit. And this is how you put it on these on these supports. So the, the alignment procedure, once we align the coils, uh, in the sector that we have to align the complete sector with respect to the, where the machine will be. And this started in June and actually it finished in October. So this is a, a complicated process. You have to have the sector hanging and then you move it up and down sideways to get it in the place where you want to get it within within millimeters. And these are the supports on which the, the, the machine rests on the right. We call these are called the toroidal field gravity support. So this, this sector on the left is, is cited there. And although this looks actually a pure engineering operation, it is not because the, the issue is that we we have to make the machine very symmetric. If you don't make the magnetic field very symmetric in tokamak, well, or also in, a, in an effusion device, if there are low N asymmetries, so the machine is asymmetric, has a bump at one place, you can actually not sustain very high pressure. So this is what we call the error field. And, uh, and basically what you have to calculate is how the plasma will react to an asymmetry and then uh, decide what is the level of asymmetry that you tolerate? And for this, we have experimental guidance. And then we have to transform this into kind of positioning boxes of every of these coils in the machine. And this is not trivial because uh, um, the magnetic field symmetry that you want is once the machine has are at, at cryogenic temperature. And once you have put currents in the coil, you have to realize that the currents circulating in these coils are very large. So the coils actually attract strongly together. And so you have to get is the final asymmetry after you have put currents in the coil and you have cooled them down to four and a half kV and to transform it into what is the alignment precision that you have at room temperature, which is in the case of ITER, room temperature is defined at 22 degrees plus minus two. So all this assembly hole and assembly pit is kept at this temperature and the point is that because we have to have millimetric precision on the alignment, if you have a larger temperature oscillation, the, the components themselves uh, expand and contract by more than you than the precision of your alignment. So we have to keep the temperature in these places very constant. So we are able to actually uh, align the coils at room temperature so that when they are cooled down and energized, we, we can actually get a very symmetric feel. And in this work that took about, as I said, one, one and a half years, actually we have demonstrated we can do it, which is now looks, uh, seems trivial, but is by far not trivial. Aligning components that weigh 400 tons um, and a measure 50 meters to, to half a millimeter is not trivial, I can tell you. Now, regarding other components that are available now, we have the central solenoid. So we have the first module at the moment is being installed. This is, we are going to build a column, uh, basically with the six modules of the central solenoid. It weights 8,000 ton, and this is the last coil we, we installed. And the, as I said, the accuracy is of position in the, the order of a millimeter. And uh, other components, these are being built, uh, the, 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 the solenoid modules are being built by, by the US are, and we expect to get them by, by the middle of next year. Now, regarding the remaining coils, so as I said, we have uh, most of the poloidal field coils are finished or they are in, in manufacturing, the last stage of manufacturing. So two of them are already installed because we installed them before we put the vacuum vessel sector. And uh, we are actually on the construction of one of the largest coils in the in the in the final 
the final stages. These are being done at the ITER organization. And this is the completion of these coils are made by layers that we call double pancakes. And this is the manufacturing of the last layer. So this has been many years of manufacturing of coils that are now coming to, to an end. And as I said, the upper one, which is built by Russia, is at the moment on the way. As you can probably, if you read the ITER news line that was published yesterday evening, after we installed the vacuum vessel sector on the pit, we actually found that there are problems with the cooling pipes that of the of the thermal seal. As I said, the, the vacuum vessel is surrounded by a shield that uh, to prevent that the heat from the vacuum vessel goes to the coil. And in the in the welding and the cleaning of these of these uh, pipes for to, to, to coat them with silver, they are coated by silver, they are well, they are so shiny. This is to radiate power away. We have found that in the process, actually, some cracks have developed, which means that this the helium that goes through these through these pipes can leak. It will leak inside the cryostat, so we can lose the vacuum, and then it means that we cannot keep the, keep the machines uh, uh, cold. So we have found also that there were some problems in the vacuum vessel sectors to do uh, sector welding, but we thought this could be fixed without uh, on site where we have the sector located. But now with this cooling pipe problem. This is not possible, so we are actually going to take the sector out. So this sector, which I mentioned, was put in in May in position, and we align until October. We have to take out for repair, and you can find more details on what are the issues and what are the plans. This is going to have an impact regarding uh, the, the operational plan, which are going to discuss next. But at the moment, we don't have a final strategy for the repair of the of the of these components. So until this is clear, we we will not be issued to will not be able to, to issue a new plan. And this we expect to be able to do towards the end of this year, early 2024. Now, the research plan of ITER itself uh, is how you plan to, to operate the machine. Uh, in its present form, has uh, three phases. Uh, uh, we have an integrated commissioning phase where we actually put the main components of superconducting coils to operation. Then we develop the ITER scenarios, but in hydrogen and helium, so the machine is not activated and we can do interventions in a simple way. And then we go to what we call fusion power operation, which is the deuterium and the deuterium treating operation to the achievement of these goals. As Elena said, this is a long process. So once the machine is finished, we should, we should be able to get into into DT operation in about 10 years. That is why I think, as, as Elena said, this is really not the work that I am going to do because I'm going to be retired by them. Uh, but uh, it is the work that you have to develop. And this will be very interesting, very challenging. And uh, and it will be what you will do if, if you stay in the, in the field, which for me, if I were you, I would stay because this is like uh, joining the, the space uh, race when you are going to go to the moon. It's a quite interesting time. And, and so, as I said, we have several phases in which we install components in a phase way, like all the tokamaks, until we get to the final configuration, and then go, we go DT. This is available at, in the web. So you can, if you look for the ITER research plan, you will find that it's a 400-page document. So uh, we are actually submitting to nuclear fusion and a bridge version uh, late, well, actually before the end of, of this year, hopefully. So this is the plan where it shows what we are going to do. The plan was supposed to start in 2025 because of the problems I mentioned. It will not start in 2025, but I cannot tell you when it will start. You can download it from using this, this code. This, and, and basically, we go through phases in which we expand the ITER operational range. And our expectation is that we will demonstrate all ITER goals after the first six years of DT operation. So these is are the bottom here. We will also demonstrate, by the way, in ITER with the, what we call the test blanket modules, the production of tritium on site at very small amounts. So we will use much more tritium that we will produce, but we will demonstrate the technology because this is one of the objectives of the of the ITER project. So in the first phase, what we do uh, basically is to commission the machine so we check we can get vacuum, we can get good vacuum conditions, we can bake the machine, we can uh, put currents into the magnets, we can create a plasma, a very simple plasma, and uh, and we can test the magnet to full current. So this is more or less to check that we the machine is basically suited to, to operate to high current and to produce high fusion power. 
Then we um, inject various uh, components, some heating systems, all the vessel components with beryllium and tungsten. And the idea in the next phase, what we call PFPO1, is to at least get the machine to operate at half of the design value. So half current, half field, to demonstrate that we can actually radiate the plasma energy away with this disruption simulation system and to explore uh, that we can actually achieve high confinement, although at rather moderate values of the of the field and the and the current one third of the of the maximum design value and this is the operational space we want to cover the star is where we want to get when we do qr curtain and this is the space we are going to cover in terms of toroidal field and current so you see we are going to be a relatively low current and low density and and low magnetic field then in the next phase we will have all the heating power available in ITER to start so 73 megawatt, this is what we plan to use for the T operation in the first phase. And here, then the next uh, objective is to go to full current and field and to demonstrate high energy confinement operation at to at least half of the of the magnitude of the of the maximum field. We we cannot go higher, as I said, because with the total install power of 73 megawatts, we don't expect to be able to be to to access this high confinement regime in hydrogen and helium. This is actually what limits this value. If we had more power, we find this easier to to achieve the high energy confinement in hydrogen plasma. We will push this this value to 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 higher values. That's the the present. There is no limit on this. It's just that we don't think it is really feasible. And then in this case, what we plan, and this is what you can read in the ITER research plan, is why we do the steps in this way. And this has to do with the place where the frequencies of the various resonant microwaves we inject resonate, and also on the energy of the beams we use, and whether they actually are ionized in the plasma, the neutrons, or they hit the wall. So there are many restrictions why this is done in this way. And you can find the details, as I said, in the ITER research plan. And then, as I said, in high energy confinement, we still remain at relatively low power. And this is because we don't have enough power to sustain high energy confinement in hydrogen or, or helium in this phase. And then we go to the deuterium uh, phase, where we first start with deuterium plasma. Then we put tritium in very small levels. We build up the tritium concentration. We build up the fusion power. And then, basically, we go and demonstrate the ITER goal. So this is what we expect to take six years. Six campaigns. So this every campaign takes two years, and of every two years we have 16 months of iter operation. So what? So we expect is that this will take three by 16 months of of iter operation to demonstrate. And this is what you actually do. We start from the same point we have experienced before in hydrogen and helium, and we go up. And the way we go up is justified in, as I said, in the research plan. And these are the three final points in iter, in terms of current, magnetic field. And plasma density. So we expect to get this condition to get to the Q equal 10 operation. And these are the two Q equal 5 regimes where we will produce 400 megawatts of, of fusion power. And as I said, this is what we expect. This ladder, we expect it will take us about, about a three, a two year campaign to, to get to the final end. Now, uh, I come to my conclusion. So as I said, the main mission of ITER is to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion. The Progress iter of construction is progressing despite challenges. So quite a lot of people are working very hard. It's not only us people at the iter organization, people at uh, the domestic agencies like Fusion for Energy that Elena mentioned. Uh, so what we have described in the iter research plan is a strategy, how we go from A to B. And of course, this strategy, uh, some of it I think is 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 based on, on hard uh, plasma physics concepts plasma stability, et cetera, which do, do not change with time, but others change with time. They are based on experiments and modeling results. So the, we think that the, the way from A to B, A, A and B are clear. The way, the way we do these steps, some of them are very solid, but all others are not so solid. They are based on what we understand today. So as the knowledge progresses, we may change the steps. So people, when, when people take this plan, should not be seen like, this is what we are going to do, this is what we are going to do based on today's knowledge. If in five years time we find there is a better way to do it, it will be changed. And this requires experimental and modeling, and also that what we predict in ITER is verified in present experiment. This is very important because we have prediction tools where tell us this is you know, as I said, this is good to do it in this way, and these things have to be verified. What we cannot afford in ITER 
is to find out things that we could have found before. There are some things of ITER which are, are specific to alpha heating and these are impossible to find out before because at the level of alpha heating that we will get in ITER, we cannot get in present experiments. But there are other things of ITER which are related to the fact that it's a very large tokamak and this should be validated against existing large tokamaks such as JS and JT60 and size scaling with the smaller machines. And as Elena said, and I want to bring your attention because these internships are mostly targeted to master students. Uh, we have published recently uh, 66 internships in the ITER organization. You can find the information there. The application, I think, is open for the next two months, so you don't, don't wait. And um, these internships cover all aspects of ITER from uh, public relations to, to science, uh, scientific work. So, the, the, of the 66 internships, I think about uh, one third are to the science and operation department. 16 are of the science division, which I lead. So there are quite a lot of internships and they have to do with uh, the plasma modeling, data interpretation, etc. So this, uh, please um, have a look because now it is the time. If you are interested, now you have like one or two months to apply. And afterwards, more or less is finished. So the Theoretically, we reopen, but in practice, we see so many applications that uh, we, we are able to select all the students in the in the first go. If we were not, we would apply. We would open a second round next year. But experience shows that in the first round, we already get quite good students. Of course, they are from all over the world, so the the, is a, the selection is a bit challenging. But if you are interested, please apply. Thank you very much. Alberto, that's an excellent talk. Thank you. And um, I'm sure that everyone is, um, how shall I put it? Um, I was going to use the word overwhelmed, um, almost <laughs> by, by, by the scale of the, I mean, that, that just that front picture, right? By the yep. scale of the project. And yet at the same time, the precision and the detail that is required, right? It's just, it's just, yeah. um, it's just amazing. So, and I said, what they said to me, what is quite, I find very interesting is that, uh, I mean, this is not just aligning. You are aligning in the plasma MHD space. So the, the, this is, I think, quite important because people see these things and the precision, etc. And you think of precision in Cartesian coordinates, but actually this is this is wrong. We do the alignment in the Fourier space of the plasma, and this is, I think, where physics and engineering get together. Because if you tell somebody to align, you basically give him some X, Y, Z, some precisions, and they align. And the issue is that when you align, there are some asymmetries, of, because you can never get perfect alignment, that actually don't matter to the plasma. And there are some that, are, that matter. And you have to identify that and then tell the engineer, no, you cannot do this. And this is why it took uh, one and a half years, because some of the things they said, no, no, this, this you cannot do. Because if you do that, the plasma will not be able to, to contain high pressure. So, and then others say, yeah, this is okay. There, there is no problem. There you cannot get one millimeter, so you get two millimeters. This is of no impact. And that is why I think that the link between physics and engineering is, is quite interesting because you got from real position to, I mean, in, in warm, as I said, temperature, then you have to do um, ANSYS modeling to calculate where the coil will be. And then you have to do ideal MHD modeling to determine what this asymmetry means for plasma operation. So it goes really from basic physics to, to high-tech engineering in, in one go. Really challenging. I mean, yeah, a really exciting, really challenging. Um, Dario, do we have time for any questions? I'm aware we're a few minutes into the into the coffee break. Yeah. So what so what I would propose is that we're starting the coffee break at the moment. So the coffee break will be yeah. from 10:30 to 10 to 10:45. But people who want to stay here and ask questions to Alberto, I think this is really valuable because not all the all the every day we have the opportunity to have. Okay. A, oh, a I think you were suggesting that there could be another like gather town or something. Maybe I can go there. I don't know. Or yeah, I don't know. Is... I mean, I am available here, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are already some questions on the on the chat. Okay. So, okay. so it, it's mainly about uh, the possibility of doing internships. Uh, yeah. To you in especially, for example, there is a question about is it open to Mexican students, and what about uh, European uh, students? Uh, students uh, in the no, UK? that's in, that's interesting. No, the 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 internships. Uh, if you look at the uh, that the internship, uh, 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 yeah, 
Okay, I explain. Yeah, there's people also answering in the chat. I, so I, will, I will make a <laughs> comment. The, 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 rest, the, the internships are restricted to nationals from the ITER members and that are doing um, a master or a PhD, because they can be also PhDs, mm -hmm. in uh, ITER members' institution. At the moment, this means that, um, that for instance, the UK and Switzerland institutions cannot apply so uh, they, they are the two if you look at the ITER web page uh, they, they are there and this is a restriction and uh, it is it is like that there is nothing we can do for phds i think it is a bit easier if we have a specific agreements with the university then the nationality of the person doesn't count but th whether the university is in an ITER member or not it counts Okay, thank you very much. And I suppose we should we should uh, encourage the, the also the interested people to go to the ITER site and read the yeah, yeah there there are all the details. The you can find all yes, the details. Right. There are, as I said, sixty six internships. You can apply up to five, and they go from uh, I said from public relations to to nonlinear MHD. So engineering, uh, I mean, lots of 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 topics. It's not uh, I said from the science division there are sixteen. But there are 66, so there are 15 on engineering, uh, communications, remote handling, you know, robotics. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many, many, many topics. Okay. Ah, uh, postdoc opportunities. Yes, we have postdoc opportunities. So in ITER, we have three postdoc types. Uh, we have one which is uh, called every year. And this is sponsored by the Monaco Principality. So we select five people every two years. So this 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 year we selected people. So the the next round of these postdocs will be in two years time. Then we have another postdoc program that is specific for Korea. So if you are Korean, you can apply. And we have three postdocs um, every two years. And then we have the ITER organization postdocs, where we have up to ten postdocs a year. Um, uh, and actually we have done. Uh, for the science division, we had uh, recruited two this year, and next year there will be three. So these are advertised. You, you should, if you are interested in postdoc, the best way is to subscribe to the emails because the, the postdocs are advertised like normal jobs. There are two years postdoc, and uh, I said we have a, a, a one this year we have one on on um, on plasma wall interaction modeling with Sol PS eater all the way to the wall, uh, but we have selected the people and the other one is on equilibrium magnetic reconstruction. And next year we will have three. We haven't decided topics, but we have three next year for the science division. But in total, there are about 10. So there are three for the science division and about seven for the engineering departments. And actually, I think there may be some postdocs for the diagnostic divisions open now, by the way. So these are, so let's say in total, we would have, they say, if I do it, it a group of two years, we would have about 28 postdocs every two years. That's really good. Thank you for the answer, Alberto. Rodi, should I get, uh, give the floor back to you? So perhaps if there are no more questions, we can conclude the session at the, this part of the of the event. Oh, there is one question more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was hoping we would have, look, the, the questions about internships are really important because we've, we've been talking about people. Um, but uh, but but I I think well, how about um, we we go to this rather nice um, but rather general technical question. Let's finish on a technical point, Alberto. If you've got another couple of minutes, um, yes. you might have seen it in the chat. What what's what's the most critical point for well for fusion or for ITER? And we'll take this as our last question. Okay, so so for me the the critical point for ITER, and I think the the point of the breathing blanket is not trivial. So the 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 critical point for me of ITER is I think. People focus a lot on the on the the, the high Q operation, but uh, which of course is very important. But to me, the more critical point of this high fusion power operation is not so much that we will get it, because I think th there is no reason to believe that if you build a tokamak which is very large and carries a high current, the tokamak will produce fusion energy. The question is how long you can sustain it. So to me, I think the critical point of ITER and a fusion is uh, integration of the hot core with acceptable loads on the world. This is critical. Then the breeding of tritium is not trivial. And uh, 
And in ITER, what we are going to do, as I said, is a demonstration that this can be done on site. So there are two of the of the 18 equatorial ports of ITER are dedicated to the test blanket module. And the goal will be to demonstrate you can actually exhaust high quality heat for electricity production. We don't produce electricity, but to demonstrate you can do that because you have to use lithium and helium, etc., and that you can extract the, the tritium from this. So you can breed tritium, but the amount of tritium that we will produce uh, compared to the one we, we, we produce in ITER is negligible. So to produce tritium in large scale in a reactor is not trivial. But to me, the ITER will demonstrate the technology. I think to demonstrate the technology at a larger scale, you will need different uh, facilities. Uh, what I think ITER will demonstrate uh, is the, the issue, what you have to do to integrate uh, the edge and the core of this plasma, because you want very, you have very different requirements. So you need the cold plasma at the edge that radiates the plasma energy away and, uh, and with a lot of impurities, and you need a clean plasma in the center that doesn't radiate the power and produce fusion energy. And I think ITER will do uh, quite um, dominated by alpha heating. Uh, collaborations with master thesis. Yes, there are possibilities. The, the main issue, as I said, uh, regarding master is that the, the intensive projects that we have are the topics that we have highlighted. So I think in that sense, if you have a topic, uh, the question is that the topic has to fit what we have. We can, of course, have collaborations with universities uh, at all levels, and we can have uh, collaborations with uh, also with PhDs. Actually, we had a collaboration with Robbie Van that finished uh, this year, actually. And uh, so we have collaborations. So I think for in a, from our side, in terms of longer term collaboration, typically we are more interested in because master thesis are six months. But of course, if you need, for instance, some input for ITER, uh, we can have an agreement with the university. So if you need to, to get some input, you know, plasma parameters from ITER, et cetera, we can provide. And by the way, we have a lot of collaboration with many universities. Thank you, Alberto. Okay. Um, yeah, no, this, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and I think, Dario, later on, you have a session on what can FuseNet do for me? So uh, I think that's what it's called. So so do so do speak to do yeah. um, for those of you who are interested in this, please do speak to Dario because even if a and I need I need to make sure I get my words exactly right. But as as Alberto said, even if you don't collaborate with ETA directly, it might nevertheless be possible to to work on a project which is ETA relevant through a through a third party which might be a, another university for example exactly if you have a collaboration with the university and we have what we have a collaboration agreement and we have with a lot of universities eh? we have with a lots of universities then we have like a legal framework in which we can do the interchange so that that's okay i mean and in general we i mean the, the only thing that we ask uh, for instance if we people ask us for data uh, the, the we we typically provide it. There is no issue to provide the data. The only thing we would like is to, you know, to get the, if you do a publication of your thesis, just to be sure that the data is interpreted in a, in a correct way. So, of course, the conclusions are yours, but, you know, we want to be sure that you have not confused the, I don't know, the units of the plasma density or the temperature, because sometimes it happens, you know, you give some data and people think it's something else and you can get extraordinary conclusions. But in, in general, we, we do, I mean, the data of ITER is, is widely available. That's not an issue. Alberto, I think we're going to, we're going to have to stop it there because we're coming up to the start of the next session. But Alberto, you're you're as always so generous with your time. No problem. I think I make a comment. The, the thesis, the thesis, the thesis, the the, the internships uh, are expected to start from February next year. So the people are selected now, and the internships actually take place next year, typically. I think the earliest one, I think if I look at the, if I have, if I remember correctly, the earliest date for the start, I think is February or March next year. Brilliant. Okay. Alberto, okay. thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Have a good coffee. Sorry, a short coffee. But... <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Goodbye. I think, Bye. I think. I think before you close the session, Roy, we can tell yeah. we can tell the audience that uh, we can have a five-minute uh, coffee break. It's going to be shorter, but still, we I guess we need it. So I will also announce the, the next speakers later on. So yeah, Roy. Okay. Okay. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, well, just while people are, are doing coffee, I'm going to do a bit of a continuity announcement. So, so I'm hoping that everyone is getting coffee, but if anyone's still listening to me, you kind of shouldn't be, you should be getting coffee. I was just going to say that um, I'm not chairing the next session, but you should definitely um, you should definitely hang around for the next session because we've got two really exciting talks from um, from Mike Jackson at, at um, Tokamak Energy and Francesco Volpe at, at Renaissance Fusion. Um, many of you will know that Tokamak Energy is pioneering the idea of high field spherical tokamaks. Um, I know a bit more about them actually because they're based in the UK already building machines with plasmas in them really nice control room if you like that sort of thing um so um uh, so we've got mike up first and and then we've got francesco who who like me actually is is kind of a, a microwave guy by training um and is one of the leading lights at at renaissance fusion which is the world's first stellarator uh fusion startup i believe so some really exciting stuff there um if you're not familiar with the with the stellarator um kind of principle or idea um then you should then you should do so um uh, it's how should i put this whenever we have stellarator talks all our students at york always come out of them saying this is the future right it's a really anyway i won't i won't steal from sort of francesco's talk but but um really neat the stellarator is a really neat idea anyway i'm afraid this is roddy checking out um for now but um really it, it looks like it's gonna be a really great meeting and thank you everyone for being involved if anyone wants to get in touch with me or fuse now i'm sure daria will tell you how, how there are only two roddy vans on the internet so if there's anything to do with plasma physics or science or rock climbing or hockey that's me that's the right one if if it's a musician it's not me i'm not very good musical so if you want to get hold of me just google roddy van you'll find me otherwise please get hold of daria and the team through fuse now i hope you enjoy the rest of the day and goodbye for now thank you